Um, okay, so thank you. Um, I'm going to tell you about this work on, on Bergenstein Bound. Uh, this is based on joint work with, with Patrick Hayden. So um, we all know that uh, information is physical, um, and uh, Bergenstein Bound is among one of the earliest results that uh, demonstrate this principle, perhaps on par with the uh, Landauer's limit. So, um, of course, he famously uh, argued that the black hole must have entropy. And, and um, in, in, in this um, uh, work in the 80s, he, he went one step further that says that um, if you want to keep the second law of thermodynamics of the whole universe, you better make sure that whatever thing you, you, you dump into black hole is not too entropic. Uh, otherwise, uh, you could violate the second law. And what he figured is that whatever matter containing a box of size r, and uh, which has energy E, uh, must have entropy being upper bounded by the product of them, up to some order one factor. So uh, interestingly, this, this result, in the end of the day, is, uh, does not contain uh, G Newton uh, in the formula. So this means that uh, it's, um, it's a statement that could be true uh, universally in any relativistic quantum field theory, because you can always consider any relativistic quantum field theory on a black hole background, and you run this thought, a thought experiment. Um, so, um, um, so this is a conjecture. However, the main difficulty is that we don't even know how these three terms should be defined precisely. So um, it's been um, a open for a while until um, 2008, uh, Horacio Cassini proposed a precise reformulation um, uh, of this statement. Um, and um, his ma major contribution is to observe that if you consider the relative entropy between whatever excited state, so this could be a state that contains this box of matter that you care about uh, against the vacuum. And um, you, if you just um, think about a cutoff theory and uh, use uh, Omagaki's formula, um, you'll see that um, the positivity of this quantity, which is by definition true, uh, would imply for you uh, a bound on the entropy. And this uh, upper bound is um, the expectation of value of minus log omega is also known as the modular Hamiltonian uh, of the associated region. Uh, one caveat is that you have to, um, because by the virtue of it being a, a relativistic quantum field theory, um, um, and if you remove the cutoff, uh, each term is actually infinity, so you have to renormalize each term by subtracting the, the va vacuum contribution. So this is what this delta means. Um, so um, a canonical example is that um, if you consider a half space, that's what, what physicists would call a Rindler wedge, um, this um, modular Hamiltonian admits uh, this uh, local integral form, uh, which is sort of like uh, R times E. So therefore, uh, it's, it's widely accepted as a good proposal for, for the Bergenstein bound. So um, you might think you know, the positivity of relative entropy is sort of a trivial statement, but um, I think the, the key insight of Cassini is that um, the Bergenstein bound has something to do with uh, state, state distinguishability, which was not previously uh, thought about. Uh, however, one uh, sort of um, concern we have is that it's unclear what kind of information is being bounded here. So, um, of course, volume entropy uh, describes the ultimate compression rate of a, of a source, but um, um, this, this operation meaning becomes obscure once uh, you um, subtract the infinity. Right? So if you care about uh, this the delta s, then uh, it's unclear. So, for example, um, you could have a situation in quantum field theory where both sides of the of the Cassini's result is negative. Um, so, so then this makes the, this, this meaning unclear. So the question we want to ask is, that could there be other versions of the bound uh, that are more operational meaningful? So we want something uh, of this form, right? You have the Buckingham bound as usual on the right-hand side, but on the left-hand side, you would like to, you would like to, um, to, to be operational meaningful. Um, so um, so that, that would mean that we better start with a, a concrete operational task and, and ask uh, this question. Okay, so um, what do we wanna do is to consider um, a quantum communication. And uh, the, the basic motivation is that um, essentially uh, what Cassini tells us that Bergenstein bound is about distinguishing states. Um, and therefore um, it's natural to consider quantum communication, which in some sense is just a more elaborate version of, the, of trying to distinguish a bunch of states. Um, 
And now uh, we, uh, for con con quantum communication, we have the tools from quantum channel theory that we can use. Uh, and the information measure is going to be quantified by, by capacities. And of course, the, the exact measure depends on which particular scenario you, want, you, wanna, you care about. So we, we're going to um, um, consider both classical quantum capacities. One upshot is that since the, these are operationally defined, um, uh, in fact, this uh, capacity uh, uh, formulas is going to be uh, always like uh, differences between entropy. So you will see that um, no UV regulation is needed. Like you don't need to do any vacuum subtraction by hand in this case. So this is um, this is the upshot of of consider uh, instead of the volume entropies but uh, channel capacities. And of course, for for the Birkenstein bound to make sense, you need to put constraints on your channels, right? So so either you know spatial constraints or and energy constraints. So um, then it's natural to, um, to, to put these constraints on the encoding side or on the decoding side or on both. Um, there are um, uh, papers in the literature which doesn't really talk about communication but would imply that uh, if you just put um, constraint on the, on the encoding but uh, do not constrain the decoder, then essentially there cannot be bound on, on, on this um, on how much information that can be read out of the state. So we're not gonna consider this option one. And um, um, we're gonna mostly consider option two because uh, this seems to be the most natural one. Um, essentially because in the uh, usual study of the Bekenstein bound, we, we, we ask for uh, a bound on, on the information for any given state. So we do not care about how they are uh, uh, prepared for us in the first place. So, uh, so, it's, it's, so the second option uh, is the most natural one. And um, we'll discuss this first and see later if we need to uh, constrain them both. Okay, so um, I'm gonna now move on to a particular channel that we set up in Rindler space and uh, study uh, whether the Bekenstein bound uh, constrains the channel capacities. So the Rindler space is basically, um, uh, basically means the, the half space on, on, on this real line. Um, now we consider uh, two players, Alice and Bob, and they want to communicate. So Alice is someone uh, global, so she can prepare signals, um, um, global signals, and uh, she will send this signal to Bob, and Bob is an accelerating agent, so he only sees uh, a half space, also called a window wedge. And um, we're gonna model this communication by, by putting some constraints to make our lives easier, and uh, we dub this channel Unruh channel. Um, so um, the, the procedure is that for whatever logical information Alice wants to uh, communicate to Bob, um, she is gonna encode her message as single particle excitations in an Unruh mode uh, of distinct, distinct particle species. So these are gonna be um, uh, distinguishable states if you access, the, uh, access them globally. However, Bob is only gonna see part of it and therefore, um, this is a noisy channel. From a more uh, active point of view, um, the signal is gonna be immersed in the unruh radiation. Therefore, the, it's gonna be a noisy. And this uh, channel has been studied uh, in the literature before. Although the physics is not uh, quite exactly the same. So, um, here, the one comment is that um, Alice is really someone who has the ability to prepare this global Unruh mode, which, um, um, which is mathematically uh, a mode that is continued from a Rindler mode. So the Rindler mode is a plane, it's a plane wave mode uh, that is defined with respect to the Rindler coordinate, and if you analytic continue it, uh, you will get an Unruh mode. So this is what this means. And uh, really, it's a global mode that a local agent cannot prepare. So we give Alice all the abilities to prepare this mode globally, uh, essentially because we only care about the Bekenstein bound that pertains to the decoder bulb. So the channel schematically can be written as a isometric um, encoding of the of a finite dimensional um, input input space. So this encoder is gonna Alice is gonna. Uh, you know, encode her information into this uh, Unruh mode of different in different particle species, and then uh, Bob is going to trace out the left Rindler wedge. So this is the the channel, and it's parameterized by the input dimension. Um, the frequency 
of this mode um, and, um, and, and this local temperature, which is also has a lens dimension um, that just measures the size of the box. So now if you examine the output entropy for any state uh, for this channel, you, you look at this delta S, basically the, the entropy gain uh, as compared to the vacuum, you will see that uh, Cassini's result applies. Um, so um, uh, the, the upper bound for any output entropy is essentially beta times omega, which is um, the size of box times the energy. So this is the Bekenstein bound. And we know, of course, from Cassini's proof, this is true. Now, of course, we care about uh, not entropy, but uh, 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 capacities. And, and um, the reason we choose uh, the, the Unruh mode, essentially, uh, what that buys us is that uh, we have ad additive uh, capacities. So we can evaluate uh, these quantities. And famously, uh, the, the, the colossal capacities are given by the whole level information or high level capacity of the channel and the uh, quarter capacity is given by the, the coherent information. Um, so um, for those of, of you who know the definition, these are gonna be involving differences of, of entropies that actually uh, uh, cancels the UV divergences. So you don't have to uh, regularize them by hand. Um, and um, yeah, so we can now can cal calculate these things because they are additive and they are single letter. Um, and compare them to the bound. So what we see is that, um, so, so, so these curves uh, depict um, the colossal or quarter capacity, and this dashed line depict the Birkenstein bound. So in, in these two plots, I vary different parameters uh, of the channel. So here is the number of species, basically the input dimension of the channel. Here is the, I, I vary the bound itself. So you can see that um, um, there's no surprises. Uh, the number of, um, you know, maximum number of uh, qubits and classical bits that are transmitted through this channel are constrained uh, by the bound. Okay, so of course, um, it's, it's kind of boring to just to conform to the bound. It's, it's, it's more, much more fun if we try to uh, challenge it, right? So um, how, how, do we, how do we make it more challenging for the Birkenstein bound? The way to do it is to consider a, communi a communication task that is less demanding. So then we have a chance of, of, of something uh, with a higher capacity. So, uh, so here's a less demanding task uh, studied by Hayden Winter um, uh, more than a decade ago called uh, quantum identification. So this is basically a task where Alice wants Bob to uh, simulate any binary measurement effect on her input state uh, at Bob's output end. So uh, mathematically, um, the, uh, the task is like follows. So for any uh, input state uh, phi and uh, any measurement, uh, uh, so, sorry, any input state uh, psi and any measurement, binary measurement phi, um, what Bob needs to do is to come up with um, some POVM measurement that is also binary, such that the effect of the output uh, after some encoding uh, is as if uh, uh, he's sitting with Alice and measure her input state directly. So if, uh, if uh, Bob can do this uh, always with, um, with a small error, then you'll say that they can achieve this, um, this, this task with a uh, K epsilon code. So basically in words, uh, Bob need to ask the question, uh, is the state phi or not, as if, uh, in a way that as if he's, he's with Alice and measures her input state directly. So clearly this task would need uh, to, to meet to this channel to, to preserve some weak notion of uh, quantum coherence, but certainly less, way less stronger than, than, the, than the, the demand for quantum communication. So um, you can um, abstractly define uh, a notion of bits called zero bits uh, based on the performance of this task. Essentially, um, if you look at this input dimension K and you say that um, um, a channel that can transmit log K amount of zero bits, if for any epsilon uh, there exists such a QID code uh, and you, you, you take the supremum and call this the zero bit capacity. So this is the number of uh, zero bits that a channel can transmit. And operationally, this is what it means. 
So um, to get some intuition, so uh, a zero bit is like a tiny fraction of a noisy qubit, right? So if you have a noisy qubit, uh, if if it's, it turns out that it can be recycled for something good, uh, like for example this task, then you say uh, uh, there's a still a zero bit left in the in the uh, qubit that uh, you might think it's useless. It represents a very weak form of quantum information, but you can use it to substitute uh, classical Bayesian qubits in many other primitive uh, quantum information tasks. So this is reported by Pennington in, in QIP 2018. Okay, so so now with with this uh, with a weaker, uh, uh, um, less demanding um, communication task, what we find that um, this number of zero bits that is transmitted by the channel uh, actually uh, does not obey the Bekenstein bound. So in, in fact, um, you know, with the increasing um, dimension, this, this thing just grows unboundedly. Um, so um, what we say uh, is that um, the zero bits will have the specious problem. Essentially grows unboundedly with, with log D. So any bound that is independent uh, of D, the, any bound that just, just depends on the uh, energy and the dimension uh, um, beta uh, is gonna be violated. So the punchline is that uh, there's no Bakunshni bound for zero bits. What we find is a sort of a counter example to the statement. Um, I wanna comment, uh, make a remark that um, you might think that um, um, this, 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 this task is just too weak. So it's no surprise that uh, we, we found a violation. Um, but um, this is actually um, a bit subtle because if you look at uh, our channel at very high temperature, uh, indeed, um, there's no quantum or classical uh, capacity, but there's an extensive, uh, extensively large uh, zero-bit capacity. This is to be distinguished from the textbook uh, noisy channels that we learn uh, from Nielsen Chong, for example. Um, and for these channels, if you tune the error parameter to, to be very noisy, uh, all the capacities, including the zero-bit capacity, is going to be uh, is going to be vanish, going to be vanishing. So the only channel is really something special where when you make this very noisy, uh, uh, it still uh, has the ability to transmit a large amount of zero bits. So they're not easy to come by for, for noisy channels. So um, therefore it's weak but not trivial. Okay, so in the remaining three minutes, I'm gonna tell you about what if now I also constrain the encoder. So now we see that we have a violation, so maybe it helps to also constrain the encoder. Um, for this, I'm going to use a bound, uh, again, by Cassini, um, but it's a sort of different bound than the, the bound based on relative entropy or the positivity of relative entropy. Now we consider a, a, a geometric configuration where Alice and Bob, um, so we have this um, um, two half spaces, and they have an overlap of region size L. And um, this is just a, a combination of entropies uh, that is upper bounded. Uh, this, is sh this is shown by Cassini. So we can uh, rewrite this quantity by introducing a purifier for this state uh, row. So um, it, then this is essentially what you get is a conditional uh, mutual information being upper bounded. Right, so this is just a mathematical result. Now, now we want to use it to let Alice only prepare a signal uh, in this half space to the right, uh, to the left. And then this is going to propagate to Bob and Bob is only going to decode it on the right. So as compared to previously, where Alice has the ability to, to prepare the global state, now we only allow it to act on the left half space. That's constrained within this light cone. So what we're gonna see is that um, if we consider any channel that satisfy this constraint, and uh, we let this reference state to be the reference for Alice's message, and Alice is only able to act uh, unitarily within this uh, left space, uh, we're gonna see that um, the second term will be zero, essentially because there's no way for this, this blue part to be correlated with R. And therefore what you'll get is a bound on this mutual information um, between, between uh, B and R. Right? So, um, and this quantifies uh, the so-called entanglement assisted classical capacity if you optimize over all input state that is between uh, Alice's message and, and this reference. And um, what you get is that um, all these capacities we care about, now including the, the zero-bit capacity or even the entanglement-assisted capacity, they all have 
um, uh, they all obey the Bekenstein bound, which is essentially the length of this interval, the, the width of this interval, and um, the energy of the code word. Now, notice that now the bound pertains to both Alice and Bob, right? Because, because this is determined by, by their overlap, and um, this energy is what, whatever energy that is needed for Alice to encode. So what we learn is that um, it's necessary to restrain both the encoder and the decoder if you want uh, everything to be Bekenstein bounded. Okay, so uh, let me conclude. Uh, what I'm showing you is that um, for, um, for the Bekenstein bound to um, apply uh, in the context of uh, classical, of uh, quantum communication, um, you need to be careful about which capacity uh, uh, you're talking about. And um, for a weaker notion of information such as zero bits, you could find violations. Um, however, we also find a, a general class of channels um, which satisfy, as long as they satisfy some geometric constraints, um, that means uh, both the encoder and decoder are constrained, then, then these things are Bekenstein bounded. Right, so uh, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thanks. Hey, questions? Hey, um, <clears throat> thanks for the talk. I, I was just wondering, so you showed that zero bits can violate the Bekenstein bound, um, and sending qubits, you don't, but if you go in between, you go to some general notion of an alpha bit. Um, do you have a Bekenstein bound, or is there some threshold, or? Right, so I, I don't have, uh, so I removed this, a slide about alpha bit, but yes, yeah, so generally for alpha bit, you also have violations. Um, but um, um, I think uh, if you fix the dimension D, then that, that will put, a threshold on the um, largest alpha for which you have a violation. But in general, alpha bits, they do also violate uh, the Bekenstein bound. Um, thanks for a nice talk. And I would like to ask in your definition of a Wuru channel, uh, yeah. is that a finite dimension input or output channel? Uh, so the output is gonna be, uh, um, yeah, so the input is finite dimensional, but the, the output is going to be a bunch of window mode. Uh, okay, yeah. um, so what's the, your meaning of tracing out the B bar? Um, so, yeah, so, so if you like, I, I only restrict to, um, um, to, to this particular mode with, with energy omega, and, um, and uh, I think uh, tracing out B bar is just, well, it, uh, um, you mean mathematically? How do I? How yeah, do I? it's B and B bar in a tensor product position. Right. I think in this case, if I restrict to the to the mode of uh, uh, of en of a fixed energy, I can I can I can factorize them, right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so 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 if you like uh, the 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 total vacuum is something that cannot be factorized, but um, you, uh, I think in the calculation, if we if we we uh, restrict our uh, space enough. Uh, yeah, essentially all the other modes, they, they don't contribute to to the story. Uh, so I think it, it, without loss of generality, we can uh, look at a particular subspace, uh, if you like, that, then for which I think uh, this is factorizable. And then the trace is like the usual thing. Yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Have you thought about using any other space other than the Rindler space? Um, no, so I think uh, one, one of the reasons is that um, um, this Cassini bound that was invoking on entropy, uh, th this guy um, does not always have a nice e uh, expression, uh, f say f for other spaces, or if you consider arbitrary regions, then it may not be a local integral. Um, so I'm using a situation where it's relatively unambiguous. What what does it, what does this bound mean? Uh, so that's why we, we use this. Uh, thing. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks. We have time for more questions. If there's any. If not, let's thank the speaker and all the speakers in this session. <laughs>